excited by Colin's book because he promised to bring pragmatism and genealogy together, which really excited me. And I'm like Stephanie, I'm going to share with you some of the reactions I had as I was reading, which were mostly disappointment and frustration and impatience, which uh, you'll, you'll see here. Um, and so that brings up questions of audience and, um, uh, and and there's judgment calls about how much argument you try to deflect before you do your applications, uh, which we're all committed here to making the world a better place. How, how many battles do you fight off bef you know, from, the, from the left or the right and not politically speaking before you engage the, the battles you want to engage? And so you'll see some of that tension here. Uh, and I'm going to present it sort of humorously uh, because I, I don't think there is a principled way to answer these questions. I think they do arise uh, in an ad hoc fashion. Okay, so Colin's book is focused on a conception of critique that he argues is best defined by the joining of problematization and reconstruction. So you've heard a lot about problematization. The reconstruction part becomes interesting. And that's in fact the title of the last chapter, Problematization Plus Reconstruction. And my comments are going to be focused on that last chapter because that's where pragmatism as the hopeful reconstruction moment uh, is introduced. So Colin begins by defining critique as the severe work by which we inquire into the second order conditions of possibility of our first order practical doings. So critique itself is a third order level of activity. And there's Colin um, doing some third order stuff. That's a Foucault hand gesture. Yes, it's nice. <laughs> Now, if with critique as a third order level of activity, Colin has produced a book of fourth order analysis, that is an analysis of various kinds of critique. And my comments are either a fifth order level or another contribution to the fourth level. Either way, this is feeling for me pretty heady territory for a pragmatist. My comments that will center around this discomfort with the many levels of abstraction and idealization that are plumbed in exhausting for me detail, yeah, exhausting detail, in a chapter of the book ostensibly focused on the importance of the practical, experiential, and experimental, which is what we expect from pragmatism. I should acknowledge that I think Colin is right about most things. So maybe some of my discomfort is simply impatience. When I am eager to see where he goes next, he instead takes the time to engage other readers who might need more convincing than I about the fundamentals of his argument. And I'm actually ha happy that Stephanie presented what some of that resistance looks like, and, and then Evan actually embodied it. Uh, so it might be that I, I just need to be more patient, maybe. Uh, so then, if given that background, some reframing of my comments is in order, so I made a new title slide. Uh, an impatient pragmatist progress, or all criticism and no practical engagement make Dewey a dull boy, or Kant, really, you're killing me. Comments on the back of the Okay, according to Colin, critique has two dimensions. Borrowing from Shayla Ben Habib's work, there she is, he labels these two dimensions as the explanatory di diagnostic, that's the first, and the anticipatory utopian, second. Okay, so regarding the explanatory diagnostic and anticipatory utopian dimensions of critique, Colin sees Foucault's genealogy as incorporating both. There's Foucault. But he thinks Foucault is better at the first dimension, the explanatory diagnostic. And Dewey is the pragmatist he spends the most, he being Colin spends the most time talking about it, was better at the second, that is the anticipatory utopian. And there's Dewey. Well, that's a cool way to think about these two. I was super excited. Okay, so let's see some of the severe critique that the new friends, pragmatism and genealogy, actually produce. Yay. I'm so excited. Okay, wait. Before he shows us some of the critique that pragmatism and genealogy together can produce, he wants to rescue Kant from himself, no less. Uh, not from Colin, but Kant from himself. This will only take a minute, I'm thinking. Please let this only take a minute. It takes pages and pages, as you can ha! Right, yeah, so mutter, grumble, transcendental, boo. More words, more words. Conditions of possibility, uh, contingency. Then we get to contingency. Yay, Kant's rescued. Okay, phew, that was tough. Let's get back to the plot. Genealogy and pragmatism are now best friends forever. We need them both to do the severe work of critique. So let's see what they can do. Well, actually, there's just one more thing. Uh, we might need to defend the claim about Dewey's usefulness from a potential criticism. 
Dewey's focus on science and experimentation, that's part of what his practice project is about, might seem like he is naively pursuing universal patterns that conflict with the pop proper recognition of contingency. If you're seeking for universal patterns, they can seem completely deterministic, but part of what a good genealogy gives us is this notion of contingency. Things could have been otherwise. So it might look like Dewey's not going to work here. However, Colin assures us we can avoid this problem by making sure not to associate universality with necessity. Now, I was with, I'm like, okay, cool, that's a good reminder. But no, it turns out you actually need to, uh, well, I should, I should say, he, he gives really helpful examples of what contingent universalization are already available to us. So that I'm already agreeing, and then he gives us these great examples, and, and this is really the, I was gonna say the meat of the chapter, the tofu of the chapter. So Ian Hackey, great Canadian philosopher, he has written on the history of probability and the contingencies that led to the universal acceptance of probability and statistics. So here, um, probability and statistical analysis can seem to many of us to be just a, an inherited tradition that's just obvious and universal, but that, that sense of it was achieved. So there's steps involved. There's a history of how probability that led to us understanding p-values and all the, the things that seem to go along. Similarly, uh, Hacking's done some cool work on the process of standardizing weights and measures. And Fosso Sterling's also done some of this. Um, my the great work in history of science on um, ways in which we came to uh, accept uh, boiling points as the, the measurements that they are, even just the uh, invention of the thermometer, all of these things took time, effort, battles, fights, and then we just take for granted that a cup is a cup, no matter where you, and, but it turns out, so those look like universal, but they, that's a, an accident of history. Um, and you will also get this in Foucault himself, uh, ways in which social, social statistics come to see by their ubiquity to be universal, and in Discipline and Punish, he gave us the history of how that developed. And then uh, human rights are another example, and, and they're not universalized yet, but when they, uh, when they do get universalized, there will have been a hard-fought history uh, lying behind that. And then a final example he gives concerns the global reach of capitalism. It can look like a necessary universalism, but Anand Singh is uh, an anthropologist he cites who reminds us that global capitalism is a heterogeneous phenomenon, can quote here, continually made and unmade. So the, uh, that those are, there are points, as Stephanie pointed to, what, what, uh, what a Foucauldian analysis can do here is we can look at those decision points and see actually where battles can be fought because they, uh, it's not obvious that Capitalism has to become, uh, the fact that it is a global phenomenon is, has been won by, by small battles and different, okay. So here's the quotation from Colin uh, that stands out for me. Understanding the actual details of these contingent universalizations helps us better assess their value and validity, which too often takes place under the sign of inflated generalizations failing to attend to universalization in motion. Three cheers for understanding the actual details. And as good pragmatists, the details come out in practice. Maybe even in the practice of critique. Is it getting hot in here or is it just me? I was like, oh, yay, here we go. I'm still hot, it just comes in flashes now. I just have to go. Okay, so having shown that universalism does not have to be equated with necessity, and by extension that Dewey, a pragmatist who had universalizing tendencies in his focus on science experimentation, needn't be read as problematic, we can get back to the plot, showing some details of what pragmatism and genealogy can do when properly paired as tools of critique for philosophers engaged in making the future a better place. Or we could say more things, that would be okay too. Okay, so maybe some readers need more convincing that pragmatism and genealogy are complementary vocabularies. But Coldlands are probably still thinking they can get by without duty. Deweyans are certainly thinking they can get by without Foucault. It's one of the reasons I never really hang out with Deweyans. I just use some of the theory to do stuff with, but you don't want to go to Dewey conferences. I mean, he's, he's, it's just hey geography. I mean, he's, he's just, he can't, he can't do anything wrong, and he's probably responsible for the internet. Uh, and so I'm sure that they really don't think they need Foucault. And uh, the kinds of battles that Stephanie was referring to uh, that Colin is fighting in the first chapters of the book uh, that I wasn't really paying attention to. Um, I'm having a better sense of why those battles need to be mounted. 
Uh, and then really it's quite dangerous for him to take on yet another huge battle, right, in this chapter to say, hey, all you, I've showed you, here's a new way to read Foucault. There's going to be some detractors. I'll see them outside later. Uh, and then you've got this new version of Foucault. Well, let me throw in a new guy you probably don't think you even need, but you really do, and that's Dewey. And certainly very few Deweyans are going to read this book, although the book was in the American Philosophy series, right? Yeah. Wait. <laughs> this suggests that was a fraught decision. I like that. All right. That, that, that wasn't just, my decision. It, oh, interesting. That confirms, oh, I don't know what to do with that. Professionalizing pressures. Yeah. OK. So I'm thinking that actually everyone needs a good dose of feminism, uh, but dear dog, let it not be more feminist theory. I'm going to just kill myself. OK, so returning to Colin. He's going to make a little more of an argument about why Foucault and Dewey are not are actually natural allies. He says, on the one hand, scientists are simply better than Foucault at explicating and defending the kinds of context-dependent normative resources that both pragmatism and genealogy explicitly call for. On the other hand, Foucault is quite clearly better than pragmatists like Rorty, gets introduced now, and Dewey at clarifying and intensifying the problematic situations in which we find ourselves. But there are also important parallels between Dewey and Foucault. Both have a problem-solving or response-giving orientation, and both are, quote, inflected by temporality and historicity. Still, Dewey was better than Foucault, he says, at trying to fix problems to make them better. That's my language. Uh, and uh, Colin's language is that Dewey, unlike Foucault, is focused on amelioration. <coughs> But Dewey needs Foucault, or genealogy, to help identify the problems that need solving in the first place. And while both Dewey and Foucault are committed to quote unquote first order inquiry and practice, a quote from Colin, remember from the beginning, and in this case, Dewey was uh, really involved in his laboratory school in Chicago. This was hands on, the, hands -on work that he did. And then Foucault, um, uh, not quite as hands on, but in his analysis of prisons, you get some of that first order inquiry. I think it was pretty, he also in, engaged in actual, you know, demonstrations of prisons and tours of prisons. Oh, cool. Yeah. Good. Thank uh, you. That's helpful. And, 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 yeah. Both are also <coughs> committed. So while they're both committed to first order uh, boots on the ground practice, they're also committed to offering a second order account of their first order inquiries. Foucault's second order problematizations help us understand that this form of inquiry is aimed at explicating the conditions of possibility of the present and doing <coughs> second order reconstructions clarify that he envisions inquiry as, in part, an explication of the conditions of possibility of amelioration of the present, or the conditions of possibility of a better future. Wait a second. Did someone mention the conditions of possibility? Uh, I, if I did, I didn't mean to. I swear I'll never do it again. Too late. Ah, I can't. Ah. OK, so then a bunch more. But then he tries to convince me, he being calling here, we really need to do this, because Rorty accused Habermas of being too Kantian. There's Rorty. Yay. But Habermas changed in just the sorts of ways we hope we can change Kant, there's Habermas, namely in a pragmatist contextualist direction that emphasizes the value of genealogy for understanding the problematic features of situated contexts. So Habermas can play after all, some people will be relieved. Even Kant can play, I don't care, but, but good. Ah! All right, so and then, but, but so let's just remind ourselves, what's the game after all that people all, that Colin has helped us see can all play together? In his concluding remark, here's the game. It's the game that, I'm calling it a game. Providing forms of cultural critique that facilitate gaining grip on the contingently universalizing conditions of the possibility of our practices of modernity. Also known as philosophers engaged in making the future a better place. It's one of the ways philosophers can be engaged in that. It's an important game, so let's get to it. I'm not getting any younger. <laughs> and um, Stephanie gave this. Uh, enough the code, let's disco, and I don't know if you guys can see how the, the pixelation, anyway, his uh, head is a disco ball. Okay, so thanks to Colin Koopman for indulging me, and to Stephanie for organizing this panel. Yay! And that's